Peter. All right, Peter, you're right. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Are you waiting for me? I thought you'd kick it off. I'm waiting for someone to hit the button. Are we in? Yeah, we're definitely in. Everyone's here. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to, um, well, welcome, huddlers. Uh, welcome to um, Unlimited Potentials um, Community Forum. Um, we've got a couple of speakers for you today. We've got Stuart, uh, one of the program directors, um, who's going to kick off for about 10 minutes. And then we've got one of our other associates, um, Peter Welsh, who's going to be talking to us about keeping healthy uh, as coaches. Um, so over to you, Stuart. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Lawrence. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to do a short session. So I'm in for about 10 minutes and Peter gets the lion's share of the presentation. Very so um, I'll uh, pass over. The reason being, um, what I'm about to present, I'm going to do three times in three different ways at the next three communities. So whilst I might be short and sharp, unfortunately, I will be back, not just this month, but next month. We've got dates in the diary ready for November and December, which we can share um, after this session. And the reason being, I didn't want anyone missing this session and unable to attend you know, the next session and not knowing about this one because I'm going quite deep into the DNA, if you like, of unlimited potential to look at our Embark Coaching Culture Diagnostic. So I'm gonna run three short and sharp presentations as we go through, and hopefully that will give you a sense of how you can relate to what we're doing um, really you know, clearly in the foreground in terms of you guys as an associate or just perhaps in the background. If it's more in the background, this could be more developmental around coaching and coaching cultures. So my one, two, three combo, um, today I'm going to talk a bit more about the client, how we could present to a client. Lots of different options there. And there'll be a call to action as we go through towards the end. I'll, next time, um, on November session, I'll talk about our workshops, again, for sort of 10, 15 minutes. And then also we're looking at planning some new research around coaching cultures as well. So that'll be the December, the Christmas special moving forward. So that's the kind of one, two, three. Um, going forward. In terms of the jump in and in terms of what Embark is, if you haven't uh, heard of it or know what it is already, and by the end of this session, and certainly if you're around the next couple, you'll know you'll be experts like uh, many of us already. So Embark is our, our kind of brand name, if you like, for our coaching culture diagnostic, and it's designed for the organization. So this is in the, in the context now of how we might present to a client. And then it reveals nine dimensions of your coaching culture. So I'm trying to get into the mindset of your being you, if you were in an organization, perhaps tasked with um, developing coaching or coaching cultures. And in terms of it, you know, how we approach it, investigating the culture further, a detailed report, obviously, around coaching culture. So today, I just want to give you a flavor of how a client presentation could run. What are the options? Because it wouldn't it be great if we're all in, you know, feel that we're, armed enough to actually have a conversation with a client around Embark and some of the work we're doing around coaching cultures. These presentations are designed to give you everything that you need. We're going to give you this deck and the slightly extended version, the kind of concertina of the deck that you can have a look at. And it's basically what we would pick from when we're working with a client. So I'm going to kind of role model a couple of things. You can start to get a sense of what the presentation might look like. And this is a good example, again, to go into the unlimited potential DNA. We'll talk about why now, and not just in this coaching culture environment, but certainly in a lot of work we do. And so with myself, Tim, Louise, the program directors, we talk a lot about these four things. So, you know, why, why now? Why is this proposal pitched up for us? Why are we working with a particular client? It might be around resilience, as you can see in the top, you know, in that changing environment, that changing world. It might be about meeting generational leadership gap maintaining authenticity and of course particularly for this one is around coaching culture so we're thinking about the things you know what is the trigger perhaps for when we're involved whether that's in a coaching program or a facilitated program and we want to kind of converse and obviously translate that to and with the client because it starts to tell the story of who we are as a limited potential and again just kind of taking a mini time out if you kind of taking this presentation on board it's you know why might you be involved in the coaching program and how can you kind of match that with the client? Now, when we talk embark and coaching cultures, all these bullet points, when you get the extended deck, they're all one slide each. So I've got my little to the right hand side, the kind of shuffling the pack of the deck. 
Um, obviously, when we go into a client presentation, we might not use all the slides. You might put extra ones in, take ones out, etc. So we don't use the ball. It's, this is the kitchen sink approach, and I'm not going to show you the kitchen sink now. You'll get those in the extended deck, and you can look at those in your leisure. But we might talk with the client about the challenges they face. Um, our story, we talk about our story of struggle in terms of working with coaching cultures, our story of finding a solution, what we did. And you know, this takes us, for example, my, myself and Tim way back to a, a meeting we had in London for, I was going to say 10 years ago, but it's probably more than that. Um, the results that we found working with clients, then we look a little bit around, you know, what, what are we finding in terms of new world and trends? What have we seen in terms of mistakes that we've made, clients have made? We go on to talk about the framework itself, which I, I will show you today because you want to see what this thing called Embark is and talk about the first thing that people can do. So in short, when we're into a client presentation, we've got all these slides at our disposal, the ones that you can make your own and move forward and take them on. So in terms of what Embark would look like, everyone wants to know if you've assumed you've done it the previous part, which obviously for today's purposes is a complete whiz through. I appreciate it's really, really speedy but we'll show them the Embark framework and we'll give a sense of how it works. We can either stick on this slide or the two that are coming up to talk about things like across the top there, the knowing, doing and being. So there we can talk about in terms of coaching culture, it's kind of like, a, not my favorite word in the world, but a bit about maturity. Capability sometimes is a bit, bit of a better word is in terms of what is coaching within the organization to maturity or capability? Do people know what it is? Are they doing it? And is it more natural? You know, and that knowing, doing, being, you can put your own language to it, but I guess you're pretty familiar with that kind of maturity phase or capability phase. In this case, we're obviously talking coaching and coaching cultures. And then the other big part of the uh, Embark construct is down on the left-hand side, which is really the location. So these are the nine dimensions, location of coaching within the organization. And again, you can put different language to it. It can be an individual team organization, you know, the classic lens that we look at when we're approaching pieces of work. But thinking where is coaching taking place at a workforce level, then that kind of mid pack, the junior middle managers and senior managers or versions of that. So of course clients have different language, don't they, for, for those kind of stratas within the organization. So essentially that's what we do. So we take, rather than it being a, um, a linear approach, this is quite a dynamic approach in terms of mapping and working with coaching cultures. And you'll see that when this comes alive uh, in two or three slides later on. And uh, I'll be jumping off stage pretty quickly after that. So maturity levels of coaching, we could go into that. What do do and be like? Probably a good option to work with clients. And equally we need to get them to appreciate and identify where this is taking place and how that might work across the, the three areas we talked about there. And obviously three by three gives us our nine dimensions of a coaching culture. Probably the money shot really is something like a sample report. It's very, very visual, obviously. It can give them a taste of what their report would look like. So to complete a report, first of all, it's free for no charge. But what we tend to do is work with clients who might want to do more than one person filling out the report. Because clearly, if I just fill out one report, this is only going to be my data. And we've done one for a, a very well-known energy provider. And I think, Tim, it was like 800 people, was it? It was huge, wasn't it? Who actually filled it out, wasn't it? Yeah, 800, yeah. Yeah. And then we were able to split it by division and geography and manager and just get amazing, you know, really rich levels of data. So we use a red, amber, green system in terms of, you can see the percentages as well. And essentially what the client would receive, whether it's just their own you know, free reports or something, you know, with 800 plus people, which is obviously huge, doesn't have to be that big. Um, you, they've got a sense now across those dimensions, whether do people know what this thing called coaching is, is anyone doing it, is it natural? And then there's locations down the left-hand side, very visually, but with some, you know, 0 0.97, 0 0.31, quite targeted data as well. They can see how they're doing right now in terms of coaching culture. And then this opens up the conversation for us. And it's obviously a really rich conversation because you can look at this chart and say, okay, it's a map. So what, where now, where are you going to put your time, energy and money into coaching? Clearly here, not by chance. This is you know, just the way I perceive it anyway, lovely band of red in the middle. So maybe that's where the focus is. Whereas classically people might think, you know, focus at the bottom across the workforce or the top 
which is more the senior manager. So it just gives a sense of, in terms of that maturity capability, what do you already have? You know, ideally that's going to be green. What are you working towards, which is more, of course, the amber, that kind of mid-pack. So you can see just these two scores happen to be in their 30s. And the scores here just happen to be in their 20s. Where are you in deficit of capability resources? And that's ultimately where we can work and consult with an organization and think, well, where are you going to put your time? Where are you going to put your energy? And that other thing called money as well. So that's what the report looks like itself. Um, just to finish up, so remember this is kind of part one of three, so absolutely fine if you're a bit baffled already, but I will come back for more and hopefully you can um, make this the second and third session. The next one's gonna be about workshops and the last one around research. Um, I'm just to leave it there really, happy to take any quick questions, but I'm conscious of time and don't wanna grab um, the limelight from Peter in terms of time. I think two calls to action really. Um, the first one was what would you adopt and adapt? from the full presentation, which we can send to you after today, just to take a look at it in your, in your own leisure, developmental, if you're curious about coaching cultures and or more targeted in a, a unlimited potential framework, if you like. So what would you adopt? What would you adapt? Feel free to get in touch with me or anyone else. Think about what do you think works really well from that presentation that you can take into your own work or you know, our client work and anything you would adapt. Um, I've moved quite quickly on this and I, you know, I haven't shared this at length with anyone else before, albeit this is something we've been working on for you know, whatever it is, 10 plus years. So there's definitely scope to adapt. Great thing about this community, we've now got a bunch of people who can say, yeah, like that, I'll adopt that, not sure about that, can we change it? So totally up for that. Uh, and also there's a couple of slides coming up next, which will be in the main deck as well. We'd love a bit of social media action. If that's your thing, if you're comfortable doing that, that would be great. And basically I've set up some template postings on social media. You can do your own obviously, but I've given you links and potential language you can use to make it a quick starter pack. Just to kind of get this going within the community in this sense about clients, next time about workshops, and then finally around research. There are calls to action for session number two, grayed out, don't worry about that for now, but you can see there's an ebook coming your way. If you fancy some bedtime reading of 37 pages or long or short, and there's also the diagnostic link. Um, there's no reason why you can't jump ahead to those, particularly the diagnostic link. Take a look at that, send it to a friend if you want, but ultimately you wanna wait sure we're ready for that as and when we get to the second and third presentation. So right now, have a look at the deck when we send it to you, take it on in your own way. And if you're up for a bit of social media, then please do so. Let me just pause for a fact. Let me just take one or two minutes and then I'll, uh, I'll jump off stage. If there's no questions, that's absolutely fine. You can email me if you want, I don't mind. But um, let me just pause for breath and water and then we'll, um, we'll shift gears into the next presentation. Okay, can I ask um, if you could just uh, jump up using chats, let me know if anybody's got a question. Don't appear to be any questions while we're just waiting there while we're on the subject of um, uh, uh, social media. If that is your thing, um, then we'd urge you to uh, seek out the Unlimited Potential community on Facebook um, and um, uh, join up if you're not already done so. Stuart, uh, there seems to be one question from Gareth. Gareth, would you like to um, take off your Mute and ask the question. Uh, I can do, but it's simply to say I didn't have a question, um, but I'd like to kind of digest and reflect on it because it looks really interesting. So thanks, Stuart, for sharing it. Cool. Thank you. Tim is pointing at a book. It's a Gareth book. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I was going to do prize giving at the end. Uh. <laughs> okay. Um, Hold right. the suspense. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Um, I don't think there You're are welcome. Any there are any other questions so Peter may we come straight over to you you certainly may am I unmuted yes good hi everybody nice to see you all hello give us a wave are you alive are you well people in the car people in the wherever there people on the phone hi 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 yeah I'm Peter hello um yeah briefly I'm a executive coach I work a lot with CEOs and MDs so I've got quite a few of those and senior managers and specialists and I love my coaching work 
and um, I also came across Coach Vision, which is the topic for today, uh, a few years ago. And I'm, currently, I work with the range of coaches, some in group supervision, some one-to-one, -one. also some MDs of coaching companies, which is interesting. So they have supervision too for their work with their clients. Um, and I think the link for me was I was at a rather dull coaching network meeting, this one excluded, of course, um, and there was this Irish woman prattling away about coaching supervision, how great it was, and I was sort of listening, la, la, la. Felt a bit of resistance in myself, putting my, pushing back a wee bit, like, why do we need this? Is this the coach police and all that kind of stuff? And the more I listened, actually, I warmed to the theme, and it was a bit like a light bulb coming on. You don't get them too often. And I suddenly saw the missing link, for me anyway, between the coach and the work they do, the client, and then maybe the client stakeholders behind, possibly the organization. And I suddenly saw the connectedness between them. And I thought, yeah, this is the kind of person who can bring that together and, and really have a great discussion around what's going on in order to support the coach primarily. And uh, from there on, I was first in the queue with my business card. We formed a supervision group. She ran it for two years. We then took it over. Uh, that was 2008. It's still running. I'm not part of it now, but others are doing it, which is great. So it has a bit of longevity. For me, uh, I'm a AC accredited coach. I'm also trained and accredited by the Coaching Supervision Academy, who do a fantastic program. You think you're a good coach? Yeah, right. Check on there. And then it's Everest the hard way without much oxygen. It's quite stretchy, but really fantastic learning. Um, I've also been involved in doing a bit of work this summer, saying to uh, Tim, just if you're going to wave a book around, I'm going to want as Ray one as well. So coaching supervision, it's a kind of uh, new sort of take, advancing practice, changing landscapes. Um, it's very much about what's new in the field and what's cutting edge. And myself and Joe Birch um, edited that with 14 authors. So that's good fun. And it's out there it's selling well. We sell 500 to date, which is great. Um, and what else? Oh, you might also notice I'm the cover boy, rather embarrassingly at my age. Uh, on Coaching at Work magazine for September, October. Sorry about that, I didn't ask for it, but if you want to read my longer life story, it's there. Um, you can pin it on the wall, whatever you want to do. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm quite an active learner, I always have been. I'm a developer of people and I love doing development work with others. And so this topic today about fit for purpose, when Lawrence mentioned it, was a real Ping for me, yeah, active learning, CPD, all that kind of stuff. It's what we really should be doing uh, for the client's sake, uh, for the client's needs. So I am very much into fit for purpose. It's about evolving our practice so that we are ready, maybe even anticipating what the client is wanting and what are the trends out there. So I think for all of us, it's to keep our eyes open and eyes wide and, and find out what's happening out there so we can evolve and change in a style that helps the client. So um, what I want to do is just talk through a few slides initially, which will just give you a bit of a heads up. Um, do ask questions, do use the chat, feed that in, that's fine. Um, we've got some breakout rooms ready for you. Yes, you've got to go there, I'm afraid. And there'll be some questions lurking in that breakout room for you to discuss. Come back and share your thoughts with the wider group, if that's okay. Um, this is not going to be a coach supervision session, just to manage your expectations. We're going to talk a bit about it and what goes on. Um, just a quick show of hands, interested there, who's um, experienced some coaching supervision? Uh, I don't mean peer coaching, I don't mean a coffee conversation in the cafe, but who's had some proper coach supervision with a trained, qualified person? People on the phone, blink, yeah, that's great. So quite a few, yeah, just around half of you. Um, and keep your hand up if you're still in active coach supervision now, if you use it regularly to support your practice. Hmm, a few less hands up. So that's interesting. Some people have peaked off. So it'll be interesting to know a bit about that. We'll come back to that bit. So if I do a quick slide share, uh, if you do that, where is my slides? There they are. Last one. Okie dokie. So we're going to have a look at fit for purpose. And can you see? Just coming up. Slide share. Thank you. Okay. Okay there. So a lot of things, obviously, to keep fit. CPD, we're doing some today. Training, of course, reading, research, all of that's really good stuff to keep us uh, our learning edge going. Things like reaccreditation, you might not often think. Most of us swear when we hear reaccreditation come around. I've got one to do this month, so I'm already going, oh my god, 
I've got to update my learning log and all that stuff. How many hours have I done this year? I don't know. But, but reoccurring nutrition is quite interesting because it makes you stop and think about your process and your philosophy and what are you doing and are you doing the same as you did five years ago? Have you moved on? If so, to what? So I think that's also quite a good way to source yourself and, and think about what you're doing today, Trim. Seeking feedback from clients is an obvious one, but I wonder how often we really do it. But that's a fantastic source of learning because that's when the client says, yeah, what you're doing is okay, but I think we need to move forward a bit now. Oh, okay, right. Self-reflection. I know Lawrence mentioned about looking at the self and that's important. Yeah, we can reflect. Some people are really good at it naturally. Others need to be a prodded with a sharp stick to do it. But having a bit of time out, sitting on a mountain, having a think about yourself and what you're doing, keeping a learning log, a diary, if you want to do that sort of thing, it's really good to track what's going on and turn the reflection into some sort of outcome. It could be in an action learning set. It could be a peer forum or a network. That's all good stuff. Uh, coach division, I hope so. Uh, mentoring, you can have yourself a really good mentor. And many other ways. Are there any other ways you can think of just quickly out there? Shout them out. Any thoughts or put them on the chat? Uh, have I missed some? Probably. What else is uh, under that keep fit for purpose CPD banner? Got reading, training. Uh, anybody shout one out? I can't see the chat room. Where's the chat room? It's at the bottom, Peter, next to your share screen. Oh, yeah, sorry. Mine's at the top now for some reason. Oops, go back one. Mine's disappeared. Uh, where is it? Where's my chat? So there's a few people written some stuff here. Uh, networking, podcasts, peer supervision, yeah. online coaching summits. Great. Great. Here it is. Yeah, I see it. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, podcasts are getting so popular, aren't they? Um, great. Okay, so we've got lots of ways of doing it. Um, what about, should we just have a quick definition, anyone? You can read those. They get longer, I'm afraid. Sorry, they're a bit wordy. I try to shorten them, but some of them are a bit academic. And other definitions are available. Is that those people who kind of connect with this have done some before? Does that fit with your understanding pretty much or why we do it? Yeah, pretty much. I like Michael Carroll's. It's nice and short. Do the work better. I like that. So, um, what are some of the motivations for um, doing supervision? Uh, why do people get into it? This was a bit of an older research, Peter Hawkins, Eve Turner, you may know of, who did some research back in 2014, so it's five years out of date. I know things have moved forward, but why do coaches have it for these reasons? The one I think's changed for me, and I'm not be interested to know what you hear, the one, two, three, fifth one, requirement of organizations using me as an external coach. And I'm sure unlimited potential come across that. That's quite a low number now. I'm hearing, and I found my, myself when I was near London, that when you go to see uh, a large organization, usually some of the big ones, they usually say, and who is your supervisor? Not, are you in supervision? So they actually want to know who it is. They've moved past the thing of, We've heard of it. What is it? Do you know of it? Um, so that's quite interesting. So I'm sure that percentage has gone up a lot, particularly in the UK, um, less so in other parts of the world. It's still evolving. By the way, I've never been a fan of mandatory anything much apart from drink drive tests. You know, I'm, I'm not really a fan of um, telling somebody in their professional practice what they've got to do and how they do it. Um, I always push back from that. So I'm more in the sort of um, advocated, highly recommended camp. I think where quite a few of the associations that I'm mentioning there sit. But um, if you're in that camp like me, that's fine. Uh, I, I, I usually push back too. 
quite a lot of anecdotal co comments. These are not my supervisees, so they are kind of independent comments. So some nice thoughts there by people. You can have a look. Yeah, so I feel a bit poor without it. Keeps me on my toes, good to be challenged. Um, I wouldn't practice if I wasn't in it. So a lot of people, these are obviously converts who've come around and, and like that approach, which is fine. Um, so if you think about it, what's your motivation? What are your drivers um, to get into that? What would, it, what would be the prompt? And it might be you're being pushed uh, by an external body. It might be you go there voluntarily. So it's worthwhile thinking about what are your drivers. And I say this is a bit older research now. They haven't done this survey for a while. Okay, so some of the benefits, obviously, and I hope this will chime with some of your thinking, um, not just for burning issues, it can be, but for exploring thoughts, bit of a thinking partner approach. <clears throat> Think about your style, step right back. Particularly for newbie, coaches I found that they're quite keen not to fall into bad habits which is great and I got a new supervisor a while ago and she really said I've come out of training school but I, I'm not yet experienced try and keep me from falling into bad habits um, difficult client coming up we all know what that feels like we have a bit of a think about that tricky issue coming up it's going to challenge us it's a good place to take it yeah, again, stepping back, what's the pattern of behavior that's going on that you might notice in others, but you don't see in yourself? We do this all the time as coaches, don't we? We see that with our clients. So here we go again. You know, I can see exactly him or her repeating the same pattern. So it's about breaking that mode if we can and, and replacing it with something more positive. The bit I also like is the real-time learning. You know, it's immediate application. It's not theoretical exercise. It's very much, we've just had the conversation. What can you take away? What can you change? and what will help your client next. And I think if you're in group work, and I've been told this uh, as well by people in groups, it's actually whether you're just more passively listening or asking the odd question, you can learn a lot from others, um, even if you're, it's not your issue or you're presenting. Um, and also we can learn from stuff so that we don't fall into that trap again. I did some coaching for the British Heart Foundation and helped to set up supervision groups in there. And a lot of them said, this is great because I don't have to go through that same experience that John just had um, or Julie just had, and I can avoid that one. Thanks a lot. So it's a good uh, preemptive strike there. Lots of issues can come up. We all know that, don't we? Conflicts, confidentiality issues, boy, especially if you're working in, in a big organization, they often want you to be telling them what's going on. Ethical dilemmas, we were talking about it offline before you came on, and you know, the rise and rise in those are just infinite and I think if you haven't had them yet you know we do have ethical issues we will have more of them how do we respond to those you know how do we know what's right to do and those are things we can take to a supervisor and chat about back to the system issues if you work particularly in a network or an organization a lot of pressure isn't there to collude with that system and, and, and collaborate almost and, and endorse things we wouldn't normally endorse so how do we identify those systemic issues how do we acknowledge them and, and deal with them so lots of things in there I think we can be aware of for me it's all about insight any other experiences out there um, from people that things they've noticed or, or have found from going to have a session with somebody else any chat points you want to raise um, things that you found unique to you that have been helpful I'm going to push on from benefits just to talk a little bit about if you take that motto about who you are is how you coach, then the focus of coach supervision is really much on you as a person, as a coach or mentor or whatever job you do. It's on your clients and the issues they bring. It's on the stakeholders and how they play out in that dynamic on the organization. If you're in working with one, the system and everybody's in a system, aren't we, of some sort. And all of that is in the service of the client. That's the important bit. It's not about 
just you, it's for the benefit of the client, as Peter Hawkins said, it, it makes a change to them. And that can be one-to-one, -one, small groups, face-to-face -face or virtually. Um, I quite like the Hawkins and Smith model. I've been using that as a backdrop. Uh, it's not the fixed one, it's not the only one, but it very much builds on the earlier work of Bridget Proctor, talking about the qualitative aspects, working professionally and ethically, keeping our standards up. It's about the developmental side. Here's the CPD bit you know the, the keeping fit bit building skills building knowledge building understanding so we're, we're developing ourselves as individuals this is us at our learning edge so one's about our practice one's about our learning and the last one's often forgotten it's about the person you the coach it's about resourcing you you know how you come back from a session you're either bursting with energy or you're feeling rather flat uh, that's often a good time to think about how do i recharge how can i find more creative ways rather than doing the same old same old and it's about building confidence um, in ourselves and, and giving ourselves lots of good reasons to feel great so we can go in and do another job next time. Um, so I think I've put below, it's not the coaching police, it's not the walk of shame. You know, it's not about <laughs> um, you know, having to uh, parade our stuff in front of others and feel shameful. It's not mental coaching, that's for the ICFers and that's very much about looking at your competencies and, and getting all that bit of practice there co-coaching, et cetera, you know, all those other versions. It's not those, it, it is a different process. It is about that. Um, any comments coming in? Tim, anything to feed in I'm not seeing there? Uh, well, Gareth talks about the difference between one-to-one -one and group work and how it how, how often, um, so group supervision offers, supervision offers multiple perspectives. One-to-one -one feels more powerful and confronting. So. I guess that raises the interesting question of the difference between the group yeah. and the supervision and what you think what you think the values are. Yeah, personally, I think they both work. I don't necessarily think a one-to-one -one needs to be less powerful. Um, you, you might be subtly challenging and supportive, of course, but uh, in a group, you've got to be a little bit careful because of the walk of shame or any embarrassment factor. I think in a group, what you try to do is, is get the sort of temperature and the climate right. Um, you were talking about a coaching culture. Well, in fact, that has to also be true in a group. Um, the group have to start to trust each other. And over time, they start to open up. That one I mentioned uh, that started back in 2008, you know, people could just sit down and say, I really screwed up today. I really screwed up big time. And they're not embarrassed to say that. And I love that. And that's really to be respected and not jumped on. But just hearing them, what's, what went screwed up, and I bet you see nodding around the room, people go, oh yeah, yeah, I've done that as well. So it's about learning from the others. And I think that can be quite soft. It doesn't have to be in their faces at all, but you do get the benefit of learning from others. That's for sure. Um, it's much more of a one-to-one, -one, but the dynamic can still be there. It's very supportive. Um, I like to have fun as well. I think fun is learning and fun is, is important too. It's not all heavy duty. Okay, um, so that's come of some of the techniques. What can you bring to supervision? Well, as I said, you can bring a specific client, one you've got in mind, one you're losing sleep over, uh, or you're just thinking about a lot. Why shouldn't we bring them to the group or to the one-to-one? -one? A particular case you're working on or a client um, organization, particularly where there's all kinds of dynamics going on, you wanna talk it through. It could be a specific incident or an experience you've, you've had recently in your coaching and you wanna talk about it. Somebody said recently, I lost three clients in a row, all within two weeks. I'd like to talk about that. Great, okay, do you think it was you, or do you think it's just bad luck, <laughs> timing, what happened? So those kind of things can, can be a prompt for discussion around that. As I said, you can do a 360 step right back and look at your coaching practice. You've been going for 10 years now. Um, the friend of mine in Brighton talks about mediocrity. He talks about it in trainers. Have you ever noticed how the trainers stand up and they always do the same break icebreaker because it works all the time and they love it. And they always tell the same jokes at the same point on the slide because it always works and gets a laugh. He says that's mediocrity. You should break it. You should change it. Challenge yourself to find a new joke. Find a new icebreaker. <laughs> you know, use a new tool. Chuck out those slides you've been dragging around for years with you. Chuck them out. Just ditch them. Or sort of dry clean, clean them out. Um, so I think... That's interesting. And the same in our coaching. We're not going to chuck everything out. We still need questioning. We need challenge, etc. But the way we're doing it, maybe that needs refreshing. Maybe it does. So it's worth just shaking it out occasionally and, and cleaning out the cupboard and having a look. 
we've mentioned about ethical dilemmas before they are becoming a big issue i've noticing that a lot coming to supervision and other related challenges um, coach the other day was talking about getting the work-life balance right that's one of the jobs we do with our clients but it just as much relates to the practitioner as well and lots of tools and models in the box there which i won't go through now because that's what we do but things like the seven eyed model could be lots of reflective practices thinking space curiosity lots of stuff in there and there's a few places you can get more information um, i'll stop for a moment any questions about that any challenges anybody wants to throw in what's on the chat groups why my view yeah groups and that prefer work group work Solution can be used to assess feedback from a co yes indeed yeah yeah again we've got the confidentiality issue as long as we we channel that that that's okay yeah good yeah fine yeah chemistry yeah got it okay um are you feeling about time for a bit of a breakout you've heard enough from me so i just wanted to set the backdrop a little bit for you so you we've all together on the same page so with that in mind um could we have a go at some questions i have a sheet of these but i i send them out in advance for people to think about but i've just picked up on four here um what i'd like uh, if louise can enact a bit of um space for the group I'd like to break people up a little bit don't put all the uh, up directors in the same room they'll only do business and strategy we don't want that um so you know have a look at those questions which one does your eye alight on and why don't you talk about that one if you've got time do two i'd really like you to drill down a bit and talk about that and share it's not a solution session you don't have to come up with trot out lots of ideas how that person can deal with it this is a listening exercise so just acknowledge understand listen you can ask questions around it but don't try and solve it please just notice be noticing what's going on everybody gets a go keep a note somebody please track some key points so we don't have to have the same meeting again and keep an eye on the time is that all right for you guys can we do it louise can you get your magic fingers working over the keyboard and uh, you can keep me outside if you like i'm available guys if you need me to come in so if you're ready way to go Yeah, the breakout rooms come in. You're going to disappear in a moment in a puff of dust. Ooh. Keep going. How many got in each, roughly, Louise? Three or four? Can't hear you. It's four rooms. Lovely. Okay. Ping, ping, ping. I can see uh, five people. <laughs> Me too. Me too. So, so it looks like we're in a group on our own, guys. Um, okay. Peter, Stephen, Tim, myself, and Louise. Okay. I am here. Sorry, I had to be on a. I had to take a quick call. <laughs> All right. Okay. Who's that? It's Naomi. Hi, Naomi. Hi. I hope it was a client. Rescheduling a session, it's fine. It's Sounds a good thing. It means I can go and do something else with someone else now. So <laughs> it was a call I wanted to take. Right, we're going to try and ping you off to a group in a sec. So hang in there. Anybody's left over? Oh, I don't mind or... hanging out with you guys. Whatever, whatever's useful. <laughs> See you okay. later. Okay. You need to click on join if you get an invite. Do you want us to respond to that, Louise? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, that'd be good.
Yeah. Oh, actually. Oh, Louise will know. <laughs> Hi, Louise. What was question one, Louise? Question one. Yeah. Right. Trying to remember now. <laughs> You're going to enlighten me. No, we, I can't get this. I can't get the um, the question. Oh. I tell you what, it's in it's in the email Peter sent to us. If you. Um, oh, okay. Right. I suspect if we're having that challenge, that all of the other groups are as well. Yeah, it may well that Peter hasn't left the um, the thing on screen for us. So um, let's. I'm going to I'm going to chat and ask a question. So I'm going to be proactive. I'll ask a question. <laughs> what was the first question? <laughs> I told him it was very relaxed. We'll get better at this. We will. We will. Yeah. So I've asked, and uh, hopefully uh, he will have sight of that, or somebody will. Tim will oh. sack me. <laughs> <laughs> We're improving, aren't we, Lawrence? So just in the interest until we get that question, hopefully come through in a second, what were the themes that were being talked about just for the last three minutes? Because I'm afraid I, I missed that. Right, we would, we would talk, um, well, um, <laughs> it's like being tested now. Um, uh, we're talking oh, it's not about, supposed to be yeah, I, think, I think the last three minutes was mainly around the, the sort of um, getting the interaction and um, uh, and getting the group set up. Uh, prior to that, we've been okay. talking about um, uh, obviously the, the points that were raised on the uh, on the, 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 the new sheet. Um, I'm not getting any feedback from. It. Can you find the question, Louise? Because it'll be in the email. Let me just go to the email. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I've got my email closed at the minute. No, no. So yeah. I can understand. We've got a number of screens on the main screen. So let me just. Yeah. Bear with me for a second, guys. Check which account I've got it in. Did you want the time when it came in yesterday? Would that help? I'm just looking to see what account it came in, so I'm sorry, I've just... Uh... Oh, well, that's okay. It would have come in, it's got here, it's um, your Hotmail account. Right, okay. okay. And um, it was dated the 9th of October, and it's 10.31. Yeah, hang on a second, bear with me. Because I've got the question slide for the breakout rooms on there. Can you see the, the questions? No. <laughs> I'm just looking okay. at the email. Luckily, I'd actually printed it off, so okay. um, it might help, mine, not really. So, I'm terrible when I'm doing anything under pressure. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, I've got no results under Peter Welsh. Oh, um, oh, okay, just bear with me. Uh, we make up our own question. Yeah, please do, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I said the, the only question I could remember was question two because I thought it looked challenging, and that was about if your coaching sessions would be videoed, what would you notice about yourself and your coaching style? Yeah, um, I thought it was a hard question. It was a bloody hard question. <laughs> I, that was the one I remembered. But the, the question one is: Do you sometimes feel your coaching session are a bit lacklustre or samey? I always think mine are tremendously exciting and entertaining. I was going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi, can you bring some balance? What do you? How do you feel? Do you feel ever get the feeling that your coaching sessions are a bit lacklustre? If I feel like that, then I'm not adding value to the client, and actually, I kind of yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I wouldn't. I don't. <laughs> He said, if they're lacklustre, then I'm probably not very well. Yeah. And I probably shouldn't be coaching. So if I'm noticing that, mm. then I would be stopping it and I wouldn't be having that time with that client because it, it's not 
an appropriate thing to do. And I have that expectation of them, actually, in the way that I work with them. I want them, you know, so if a client shows up and says, oh, I'm not feeling very well, then I always say, do you want to postpone? Do you want to carry on? We, you, know, well, you want people to be present, don't you? And I think... Yeah, otherwise all, it's a waste of time for everybody. We all sort of react in the moment. So we have to be quite versatile in terms of what you find is what you get. And obviously if it's, if it's lacklustre and they're lacklustre, you're going to be, you're, you're going to mirror that. And it's, it's, as you say, it's, it's, it's about putting it off to another time. And I know I'm probably not on my own here that I always leave plenty of time when I'm traveling to a coaching session so I can just have like 10 minutes in the car or 15 minutes mm. in the car. And I have actually used sort of, um, not exactly meditation, but well, the guided meditation I've used on a couple of occasions where traffic's been really bad, just to bring yourself down and to sort of empty your head so you you're there you know you've got obviously you've got your preparation based on if you've seen that client before um and but we all know that once you've checked in um in terms of what, what you've seen before you've got to respond to to that moment so i think it's a fairly dynamic relationship that we have um and um with our clients and i, I think you know if i was I mean, I've done some peer supervision where people have been going through some monumental difficulties in their personal life. Um, and they've talked through their experiences and going into, say, a series of a week's coaching session for the last one that I had. Um, and we talked about, you know, whether they'd be fit for purpose and what was on their mind and could they disassociate themselves from what's going on in their own private life to what was going on, you know, in that coaching relationship. And we had probably about three quarters of an hour, very detailed conversation in which the self-examination of the person I was peer coaching um, was, was quite challenging. Um, and they came out of it the other end uncertain. Uh, and then when they reflected on the conversation, they actually thought the benefits of the conversation, so I suppose the supervision it brought and the challenge that I brought um, enabled them to think how they would deal with that. Uh, more appropriately so I know that's useful in terms of the live experience it's my only experience of coaching somebody that was in a sort of very lackluster and and distracted um state uh, sort of emotionally before going into a week's sessions of a session of coaching I think that's useful Lawrence because I think it's the word lackluster the way the question's worded I'm implying it am I lackluster and that's not what I feel, but the client can be. Yeah. And there's a difference there, but I, I do agree. I've had clients where you've gone out of the professional sort of sphere of the worky stuff that they've asked you to come in to talk about, and you've gone elsewhere and you spoke about partners and stuff. And I even had a client recently trying to give me sort of marriage guidance counseling, and I'm thinking, God, I don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the people are wider than their work aren't they and what the original contract may be about and you have, to have that flex to go with it but I, I don't associate lackluster with myself even if i was tired and lethargic i think i'd put a smile on yeah as naomi said if you're lacklustering you're probably ill and you probably would have foreseen that and probably not gone in you'd have delayed the yeah or postpone the coaching session. Mm. Yeah, I never think, I never think even with the same client, one coaching session is the same as the next. No. You know, there's no template or there's no structure. You can have a loose structure or a semi-structure um, in mind, but then it can all go out of the window when something comes up that's a greater priority for them. Mm. Sorry, time's up, guys. Thank God for that. <laughs> Nice to both of you. Good chatting. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Okay, just going to close it now. Hello, we're back. We're coming back. Hi, hi. There's a few people come back. I'm unmuted. Hi, right, can you hear me at the moment? Yeah, good. 
just while we're waiting for the other few coming back, uh, thanks Louise for doing that. Um, any quick captures, nothing revealing, nothing too confidential. Don't say, you know, James said and all that. Just anything come up that you've noticed in that session? Which question did you tackle, first of all? Go ahead. We tackled um, question one um, uh, and um, about lacklustre, um, <laughs> which was um, quite interesting when we actually found the question. Um, and um, there was a number of expressions uh, of, uh, of interest about this. I don't think anyone particularly felt as if they did lack lustre. And we talked very much around how the relationship, the coaching relationship is very dynamic um, and about how no two sessions could be the same, even with the same client. Uh, and that you might semi-structure and prepare, um, but you know you don't know what's a particular priority to the client on that particular day. So it's sort of you, you tend to have to be uh, fairly dynamic, and your energy reflects that uh, yes. from the client. And we there was another school of thought in terms of um, we don't see ourselves perhaps as lackluster, but we sometimes see our clients um, as lackluster, mm. and it's our job to be able to challenge and support that. Um, and um, there was a, a school of thought that somebody had a feedback from a client about that they weren't very well that day, offering the opportunity to postpone that. And certainly if we were going into, there was a feeling that uh, if any of us were lacking luster, we probably weren't very well, and we probably should have or would have avoided or postponed that meeting to ensure that we could show up and be present and, and not lack um, uh, luster or be go on to autopilot. We don't. I think the feeling was there's not an autopilot as being a coach. You, you could, there's not a default mechanism that you can fall back on and just glide with. Yeah. Um, we also talked about you know different strategies of, of, of being in the moment and preparing perhaps after a difficult drive and about some guided meditation before you actually go into your session so you can clear your mind and just the, the default is your semi-structured approach to uh, what you prepare for that particular uh, session. I don't know the guys from the, the team I was in whether there was any other uh, points that we we raised. I hope I've tried to remember uh, pretty much all that we spoke about. We we covered a lot in a short space of time. Sounds really good. I like it. Thank you. Yeah, but my thinking would be about energy and presence, mindfulness, and also it's just a, a call out to be aware of that and to maybe refresh our approach from time to time because if, if we feel lackluster. Uh, the client will probably feel it. So I thought that was a, a good one for that. Thank you. Great stuff. Other questions? Who, who another group? Did anybody else do another question? Anybody else on mute? We did a, um, you did say, you, you did say that we were not to put three of the program directors together. And when we broke out, it was me, Steve and Stuart. So um, yeah. we, we, <laughs> we did try not to get distracted. But we did. Um, but <laughs> we, did would. We, we did get a couple of questions answered. So um, one of the what's your greatest char char challenge currently as a coach? Um, you know, my first word that came to my mind, uh, and Steve said the same thing, was that is it finding work? And um, you know, although we don't, we're not short sure coaching programs as a company, you know, as individuals, I would imagine the, the challenge is there is to find enough work to keep you going. Um, but I think you know, doing the right thing. Uh, so, you know, do I know whether I'm doing the right thing in the coaching session or not? And, and who's going to tell me it is? Um, and uh, Stuart talked a little bit, and across a couple of the questions actually, about energy going out. Mm. And where do I get it coming back in? Yes. Uh, you know, because Stuart's been quite busy doing a lot of coaching at the moment, and he's become aware that there's a lot of energy going out, and how does he get it back? Yeah. So I think, you know, that, that's a fair point. You know, if you, you can sort of ring yourself out. Um, and you know, is supervision the place to get that? Well, yes, I guess it is. Yeah, it certainly is. The resourcing bit, by the way, that third circle I showed you is very much about that, making right. sure you, you get a bit something back and just sometimes acknowledging you know, that you put a lot out there. You're giving, giving, giving. It's like ringing out that tea towel. Keep ringing out, there's not a drop left. And, and we need to give back to ourselves and replenish. I guess it raises a question. Do any of the other coaches that are listening in find themselves thinking, why am I always giving the advice? And do I, you know, whenever you talk to somebody, you find that all they talk about is themselves. I mean, is, that one, is anyone going to ask me the quality questions that I ask somebody else? And because uh, and we're all professionals and those people aren't that you meet in wherever you are, 
it, yeah, it can be quite exhausting. It's, I've never really thought about it like that. Difficult yeah. to facilitate yourself, isn't it, really, and ask you the, ask those questions, which is our bread and butter. Totally. And when, it, yeah, when somebody else asks you a real simple stock coaching question, it can still be powerful. Even though you know the question, you go, oh, yeah, that one. Then you have to answer it. You're suddenly the client almost, you know, and you have to respond to it. It's still meaningful for you. And I think I wouldn't degrade that at all. I think it's really important. Um, yeah, we dealt with challenge in my small group, and it was very much about the, um, I just guess, sort of trying to sort of even out the time pressures, you know, lots and lots of demanding clients, great, really busy, fantastic. Um, but it's also about, I've got no time left, I'm sort of maxed out. So fitting all the learning in, doing all the right things, doing all the marketing, brilliant. But it, it comes, it can come, question, can come at a bit of a cost. And I think the main thing there is to be aware that it's happening and not to burn yourself out and, and get ready for that next change. So it's transition for clients, it's transition for coaches too. So a good supervisor should be able to talk that through and help you get your plan and also get it in the muscle because it's really easy, isn't it, just to keep on doing what we've already doing uh, and, and not worry about tomorrow. Well, we need to worry about tomorrow and the day after. So that's also fitness for purpose. I love it. Great. Are we done with the questions? Any just trawling around the room with any other questions dealt with? Nobody did the video one? We did tackle the video one very briefly. Um, Steve said, the, no, no, no. The answers that came, well, only briefly, because we talked about other things. Um, we talked about a challenging, uh, aligning and reflective. So you'd see me as being somebody who mirrors, if you like. Um, and then also intuition. So, you know, using my gut, if you like, to join the dots. Yeah, very good, very good. All right, that's great. Thank you for having to go at the room, uh, the uh, the chat room. Appreciate that. But just to finish off here, so that's that bit. Uh, I'm just going to go back to screen share. Are we on screen share, Louise? Yep. Yeah. So uh, just make sure I'm on screen share. Two six. Oh, have I lost you there? Are we on screen share, everybody? No, no, we're not. At all. no we're not. If you click on share at the bottom on the menu bar, you should be able uh, yeah. to share oh, sorry. the screen. It's, it's popped off, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're getting there, getting there. It's really the, the end of the, the game. I just wanted to pull it together and just say what we've been doing today. We've been having a look at um, the idea of keeping fit and, and being staying in purpose for our client. I think that's really important. And there are a range of ways, as we said, it's about, we try to define what the supervision bit's about. Horrible name, let's not go there, but that's what it's called. It came from another field, so we have to get over it. Um, why coaches get into supervision, whether for reaccreditation or whatever, um, lots of benefits to be had. Um, and what goes on in those sessions? What can you bring to a session like that? So I think that's what we've been trying to cover today. Um, do get in touch if you'd like to chat about group supervision or one-to-one -one work. Um, special rates for the UP community uh, and that's me there and I've really enjoyed it it's coming up to two o'clock so I'm going to say thank you for your time appreciate that thanks for listening back to Lawrence and to Tim yeah thank you very much um, Peter thank you for uh, that session it's been uh, very interesting and for me I suppose a better word than supervision might be about reassurance um, uh, but um, thank you very much. Can I just remind everybody, and we will email this out, there's a guide, a, an unlimited potential guide to supervision and CPD, which we're going to, um, which Tim has already dug out and which I'll circulate um, when we circulate the recorded material. Um, but just a sort of a, a, another shout out for um, ongoing conversations that people might want to have. If you um, search the unlimited uh, potential Facebook page then obviously you can uh, we can befriend each other um, and and have separate and additional conversations in relation to this we fixed the dates because Stuart's got the next in his uh, series of three short sessions in November and December we've got the dates for those Louise will remind me what those dates are in a moment but we're also um, very grateful for those people that I've been in contact with and those that have contacted me and we're going to have some sessions that we're looking to book now and program for the next two and for the first quarter of the next year. So if there's anybody that's interested in sharing a theme or taking and facilitating a session, that would be really good. We've, uh, we've got some sessions coming up around 
um, clean language, um, hopefully around storytelling um, uh, and uh, storytelling in coaching. Uh, and also we hope neuroscience, although that isn't um, uh, firmed up yet. And also interestingly, um, alter egos in coaching. So we hope to have a variety of uh, things that we're offering and some sessions that we're uh, gonna be offering once a month around mid month on different days where people can, uh, can hop on to the session, but they are all recorded and they are circulated around. Whilst they're recording, we do appreciate the participation because we didn't have the partition of the people that participation of the people that showed up, um, we wouldn't have um, anything to record and send out. So thank you very much. Um, we've got one last final thing to do. Uh, perhaps this might become a regular feature, but it's a pri prize giving. And uh, just hand over to Tim now uh, for the prize giving, um, and um, and I'll lay down the. Um, the, 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 uh, the offer now of what we can what we can offer prizes in in the future. Thank you, Lawrence. So last time we had Brian Underhill from Coach Source, and he did some tests on uh, where he was in the world uh, through his pictures from Starbucks, which is an odd hobby taking photographs in Starbucks around the world. Anyway, Gareth cleaned up and um, <laughs> and so it's all with us. Slightly squeezed Brian's uh, uh, um, to, for a book, and um, here it is. Here is the book. Hope you can see it. And I, I was in San Francisco last week, Gareth, and he's actually signed it with your name on there. So uh, congratulations, um, Mastering Executive Coaching. It's the latest, probably one of the biggest books that will come out about coaching at the moment. Uh, Brian's obviously authored it, but he's got um, Jonathan Passmore and Marshall Goldsmith to contribute to this book as well. So. Um, I suspect the, the uh, quality of the content of it will be big. So um, I'm seeing you in a couple of weeks' time, Gareth. So I'll hold on to it till then, but well done. Cool. Oh, thanks, Tim. <laughs> and you should congratulate yourself on your knowledge of Starbucks around the world. I mean, <laughs> just amazing. Yeah, I need to get out more, I think. <laughs> We're sending Gareth uh, postcards from Starbuck views from wherever we travel. Um, I don't, I'm not sure they've got one in Aberystwyth, but if I find one, I'll send it to you. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Independence, Gareth. You need to be supporting independent coffee shops, you've got to. Uh, yeah, right. I agree. I agree. <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, thank you very much. And um, we'll be in touch about the November date and the December date um, straight after this with the, um, the materials that we're going to circulate. And we'll hopefully join you um, uh, mid-November. Um, and um, thank you very much for participating. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.